Test one, two. Can you guys hear us? Yes, we can. I can hear you. This is Gayla. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started today, and today we have the privilege of having Deputy um, Cheryl Allen with us today talking about workforce redesign and specifically what's happening across our state and maybe even more specifically on or near reservations. So take it away, Cheryl. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you today. I'm trying to determine what's the best way to say hello to you. So hello, yate e, kia ora. And halashomi chitore. So, lots of ways in languages that we can greet each other and welcome each other's strengths. I think it's really important that what we choose today is going to define tomorrow. And we have been looking at educator workforce redesign now uh, for just over one year with decisions that are being made today uh, for tomorrow. So, let me start with the question to this esteemed audience, which is this, do you believe there is a shortage of teachers and other employees in our schools today? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, very short. And if so, why do you think there's a shortage? I think that the the opportunities, the, the training programs to become a teacher um, are, are there, but um, there may um, be a lack of incentivizing or um, or even just the financial support students need to to become a teacher. Teachers are are very um, highly needed on on Fort Peck Reservation. I know that but it, it does take quite a bit of training to, to become a teacher. However, there, I know there's a shortcut if you can get a class seven, it's kind of a fast track to become a, a cultural and a language teacher, but other than that, it takes years and years. Of, of Thank you. Time. Thank you, Lance, spot on. Let me share a little bit of data with you, and this is very recent data. So currently there are 119 and a half unfilled teaching positions on or near tribal lands. I'm going to just stick with data that is relevant to tribal caucus today. So think about that for a second. 119 and a half uh, teaching positions that districts were unable to fill. I always look at it this way. At the long and short of it, the most important adult in schools is going to be the teacher. The most important adult is going to be the family, is going to be that parent and family support. But when you get in the schools, the most important is the teacher. They're the ones that are working on student learning and on relationships on, on all of the elements of understanding how to engage each and every student. Emergency authorizations is another pathway. So that means a school district gets hold of the OPI and says, we can't find this teacher. We've looked and looked, but we have someone else that would teach this class for a year. And so they get an emergency authorization. That number is 168. Three years ago, that number was 15. So we're seeing those transition points. And you've got some of that data for you. Uh, I'll give you another one. Our OPI job board has 605 uh, positions being advertised right now. All of those have a February date on that. 22 data from initial licenses from our university systems that develop teachers is 488 in 2022 out of state is 897. We're getting more and more requests near or on our tribal lands uh, to make adaptations to Western governors. It is the fourth largest developer of teachers in Montana. So what we know nationwide is the decline is 35%. 
what we know in Montana is that we're mirroring pretty closely to those choosing not to go into education. So we have a call going on today with a gentleman named Dr. Yang Zhao. And he is a researcher and he said this, he said, teaching, there's two things at play. Number one, it doesn't pay a whole lot of money to be a teacher these days. And it takes a whole lot of education as we talked about. He said, so there's one factor. He said, the second factor that's impacting teachers is the sense of value of the profession by non educators by communities, by families. So I gave one greeting to you in Persian today. So as my dear family and friends from Iran growing up in Persia, they said this, the most important profession in my country is the teacher. We write them into our family wills. We honor them, we value them, we cherish them because we recognize that influence on our children. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? So I, I will challenge us as we go through this to look at the ways that we're honoring our teachers. And when we look at tribal lands and we have a tremendous amount of work going on with the element that honoring our teachers starts with our elders. It starts with the knowledge keepers and how we use the wisdom, the strength, the understanding of life and relationships to build that understanding in our students. We don't think it's all about academics. We have been working on solutions at the OPI. You've been helping us legislators with that. In 2021, a bill was passed for Grow Your Own, two plus two programs, Teachers of Promise. Our two plus two programs are predominantly attached to our tribal colleges, which is exciting for us. Our uh, Teachers of Promise, which is high school age, is attached right now to Northern in Haver and Haver Public Schools. Great Falls Public Schools and MSU Great Falls. Both of those communities have significant tribal populations. So the goal is to get students interested in experiencing elements of teaching by being teaching aides and assistants to see if they wanna pursue that profession. We also implemented, and we're in year one, and you will appreciate this, we're in year one of a teacher residency program. We know we have to have two things happen. Residency answers both of those. Number one, we have to be able to develop our teachers so they hit the ground running on day one. If we're not doing that and they hit day one and they had no understanding of what they would be experiencing, they didn't see the opening of school or they didn't see the closing of school and they get hit hard, they don't have relationships yet, they're leaving. We have more people just literally leaving before their contracts are up than we've ever had in Montana. Just walking away. Teachers, superintendents, principals, paraprofessionals say, nope, didn't know. So one, we knew we had to address that issue. The second thing we knew we had to address was how we get our people to stay in Montana. So we did two things. Well, we did multiple things, but I'll start with this. So as we discussed this with our think tank, discussed it with the superintendent, discussed it with legislators, discussed it with districts, discussed it with the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Ed, we determined just like other internships or apprenticeships, they're usually paid. They're not come and pay your tuition, and try to work a job, oh, and practice becoming a teacher. We know there were flaws. So we went to the OPI's ESSER ARP dollars and looked at what was happening nationwide. And the low was about 12,000 and the high was about 20,000. So we said, we've got to compensate those teacher residents so they can focus on learning to be the best teacher possible. 
So we set a compensation at $14,000. That's not a whole lot of money, but it's better than none. That was the first thing we did. The second thing we did is said that our districts had to take care of housing. That was the barrier that the EPPs, the Colleges of Education told us, is they can't place people in our remote communities, our rural communities, because there's no housing and there's no jobs those two criteria. So we went to the districts and said, you need to figure out their housing. We didn't tell them what it had to look like. We said they had to provide it. Whatever that is, it had to be clean, it had to be safe, and they had to have technology connected, connectivity so they could continue their college courses. And all of our districts involved have done that. 62% of our residents were in our very first year 62% of them are in tribal schools. Let me say that again, 62%. And guess what? They're staying. We think that's great news. I appreciate what Karina Gardy P. Hall told me out of Browning when I went and visited with her in August about, because we were just getting it started and they took a number of residents and most of them from their two plus two program. She said to me, she said, Cheryl, it's a no brainer. So well, tell me more, Karina. She said, I'm going to end up paying $65,000 in taking care of housing for my residents. That's about what I pay for one teacher in a year. I'm going to have five teachers in the fall. It's a no brainer teachers that know my kids, know our community, know our school, know our families, they'll stay. I think that's powerful. I was talking to a county superintendent. We have residents placed in very small, uh, remote. She said, this is the best thing the OPI has ever done, in my opinion. I said, well, thank you so much for your opinion. We think we do lots of good things, but we think this is important. She's got two little schools. And she said, we've already offered a contract to one of those residents. The second one, we offered a contract. And she said, my fiance and I are moving to the eastern part of the state. So we built in this year that they had to spend two years in Montana teaching at the conclusion of their residency, that clawback piece. And we have not had any challenges. We've talked to our residents. This is what they're telling us. They said, I can't imagine what it would be like in traditional student teaching where you don't get to see the whole school year. You don't get to know your community. You don't get to build relationships with your students from day one. And they end up saying this, we love our rural communities where we are. We really focused on rural placement this year to make certain where our disproportionate needs were got residents placed with them. And they're saying, we love it. Two of them made this comment. Well, when we started, I, we didn't know if we'd even wanna be teachers. We know we wanna be teachers now. We believe that the investment is worth every penny when we're able to address the shortages in our rural communities. So we had 18, 18 residents right now. We're gearing up right now for 60 in the fall. So that's going to require more districts participating. We've been recruiting, we're over 22 districts. We have 11 this year. We think we'll be at 40 by the 1st of March. The, Education systems are already working to place folks in these different communities. And there's a change. Uh, there's a bill, Representative Barker will be carrying a bill on teacher residency, $2 million uh, for uh, fiscal year 25 to continue the sustainability because the OPS or ARP dollars will be gone December of 2024. I have had legislators say to me, I would rather fund this ahead of a lot of other things because we see a different benefit. We see a different outcome. 
we see a different commitment to the effectiveness of those beginning teachers. Yeah, Lance. I don't have a bill number yet on that. I'll send it to you. I can send you the LC on that as well in the draft of that. At the same time, Representative Running Wolf, who in 2021 carried the Grow Your Own bill, has an LC to continue Grow Your Own. I want to say again that a number of our residents, all of them in Browning, came from Grow Your Own. We think it's an incredibly important program. Our EPPs, University of Montana Western, is the key uh, university working with Grow Your Own. They are adding Fort Peck uh, to their Grow Your Own uh, model for this next year. We're excited about that. That's year two. When we get to year three, that number is moving to 120. So you can see we're very intentionally and deliberately growing that target for residency. At the same time, so there's a, a number of initiatives, but I really wanted to emphasize the residency because of the impact it's having in our tribal lands. Teachers of Promise is having an impact in communities that serve a number of our tribal students and they get paid. At the same time, we're working on three other really key initiatives. One is we're working on the registered teacher apprenticeship program that's gotten national news. So we've been working on that. So what would that look like in Montana? We look at Teachers of Promise, that high school level, where they're exploring, are they interested? And it is paid, just like if they went out and did an internship with a dealership or a plumber, there's payment. So they have to be paid in the apprenticeship. We're working that in those two years, they're also finishing their associate's degree because that gives them a leverage and then they're, we're covering those costs. That's our goal. Our goal with registered teacher apprenticeship is that, as you said, it takes a long time and it costs money, that we can cover and figure out who, how through the registered teacher apprenticeship, there is no cost to get your bachelor's degree and, and go into education. So we're working really diligently on that. Yes, sir. Yes. On the reservation, is the, the uh, parents have not, so they're hesitating on sending their kids to school. Another thing too is, we're at twenty one thousand, and North Dakota is over a thousand dollars more than us. So I mean, we have problems both with parents and with the teachers. We do, it's one of the things we love about Grow Your Own and University of Montana Western. They have the largest, what's called place-based. So if I live in Lodgegrass, I can do my education right there in my community. I don't have to go away uh, to college in order to, to have those opportunities. So we have been leveraging the University of Montana Western pretty heavily. And going into this next year, they are going to be our lead uh, college because of that strength they have. And the rest of our, our universities aren't quite there, but we're gonna work with them of how they place as well. But you're absolutely right. It's a huge challenge. Why would I send my kids when I don't know what I'm sending them to? So we're looking for those solutions and building out a community. And it brings up another conversation that we're having. I know lots of people that don't have college degrees, but they teach in lots of different ways. They may be teaching art classes in a community. They may be teaching swimming lessons. They may be teaching youth about culture and ways of their people. It, that list is pretty vast. So I've been in conversations with MSU Northern in particular about how do you take those experiences and translate it into what we call the credits to get a degree? So we're working on how we build those competency pieces out, which brings us to another effort we're working on. We have a shortage 
of special education teachers in our state now of over 100. Special education teachers can't have an emergency authorization. They can't be misassigned because there's federal rule around those services for our students with disabilities. So they have to have a bachelor's degree. And then the federal government says they have to have skills in two areas. We pay for people to go back and get their special education degrees, the OPI does. We pay for people to go get their school psychologist degrees, those hard to fill. We spent time with the University of Utah and their state department. They built a different pathway. In Utah, they came and said, we have a special ed teacher shortage that is substantial and it's going to impact our ability to meet the services that they need. So they went and built out what they call a competency-based pathways. What are the competencies a special ed teacher would need to have? They built out a completely free system. They thought this will work, yeah. Is there any way we can get reciprocity with some of these states? We, yes. The, the reason why I ask is I've got a daughter-in-law yeah. that transferred to Poplar and she had a hard time getting certified. And she, she taught for three years in, in uh, Minnesota. So we really worked on that. A year ago, we redid the licensing requirements and we made a, a significant number of changes and reciprocity was one of those. So if this has been recent in the past year, you tell her to call me. Seven years ago. Yep, yeah, that's why we just changed the rule with the board a year ago. So we did build increased reciprocity. We also built into that for our military families that if they have military uh, transfers into Montana and they have a family member who's a licensed teacher somewhere else, we automatically accept that license. We do not take uh, military families that are transferred and then say, oh, sorry, you have to jump hoop for us. So we take those immediately. We've worked on reciprocity. We've worked on alternative certification. So we have alternate paths. And we really reshifted a lot of these to say, if you've got the skills and you've got these things, we don't want to be the roadblock. So you're absolutely spot on. It has been a problem. And I appreciate it uh, when Dan Schmidt called me from Poplar. And this was two years ago. He said, Cheryl, I just want you to know your rules are stupid. <laughs> I said, I said, thank you, Superintendent Schmidt. Let me remind you, they're not my rules, <laughs> but I'll work on them. And this is what he told me. I got two teachers from out of state, 20 years experience each. And the rule said they had to take the praxis, a test. And they're not going to do it. I said, well, I don't blame them. So let me finish the story. We got to the end of that school year. The rule changed in July. It's June. They resigned and said, see, yeah, we're headed to different places. We were one month away from addressing that problem for them. And when Dan was telling me that, it was like, dang, I have to make certain that rule changes that people don't have to take a test when they already have a license and have successful experience. We don't need a test to tell us what we already know. So that was a change that we made. We also, the superintendent built a substitute teacher professional development option. So we have people that are substitute teachers who say, gosh, I wish I knew more. Is there any way I get recognition that I've learned and so we're building what are called stackable credentials, which means I have, I have learned classroom management. I have a stackable credential. I have learned how to apply lesson plans. I have learned the substitutes are asked to do a lot of different things with a lot of different disciplines. And if they don't have some core foundations, a lot of time, they're just trying to keep the kids uh, calm in the classroom. We think it's more. So that's in play now. 
we have been doing ongoing leadership development, both at the teacher level and the executive level. We're in our second year of that. We bring in expert faculty that work on key issues. But we start every session uh, with a tribal elder who comes and greets people to this land, explains cultural perspectives, and leaves them with a blessing that their hearts and minds are open to how they can serve children. And it varies. So Dr. Zhao, who's with us uh, right now, last year he came up to me and he said, Cheryl, I said, Dr. Zhao, he said, I have traveled the whole world, teaching, providing learning and doing research in most every state in this country and Canada. He said, I've seen this in two other countries where they bring in the cultural uh, elders, their wisdom, their knowledge to open the session and acknowledge uh, whose land you are on. He said, this is the only time I've seen it in the United States. We made the commitment when we started these academies that for Indian education for all to be solidified, we needed to walk the talk. And we have. We ended last year with a, two days of indigenous learning from all the different tribes. We opened this fall in August with representatives from multiple tribes. And Dr. Henrietta Mann was with us for two days, if you know Henrietta. And Dr. Earl Barlow was with us for two days. This is what our leader said. We just wanted to sit in their presence for more days and more days and more days because they opened us to things we had never, ever even thought about. We believe if we can do that piece and recognize the importance of the value of our elders, because our tribal nations honor elders way better than anyone else does, that we will start building in our students much deeper understanding about who they are and why it matters. We believe we must walk the talk. So in everything we're doing, it's trying to acknowledge and address. So if we can get our, our tribal schools and they all have challenges like any other school, if we can place residents there, if we can get special education teachers there on a different path, if we can find a way to support the substitute teachers that they need and help develop their skills, if we can build ongoing leadership capacity of which we have had representatives from our tribal lands every year or in year two, we intend to continue that. And what we do is we're trying to build this community of understanding and we just can't get there if we're not all together. So I will stop there and see what other questions you might have for me. <coughs> Excuse me. That's been a problem we've had is the teachers that have been coming in are not used to the tribal ways. Yeah. We had a uh, history teacher last year that left us in the middle of the school year because he could not get used to the tribal ways. Mm -hmm. He wasn't about to learn either. So you've got to have a teacher that will learn. Totally agree. And it isn't taking marry a local person either. Because mm -mm. they just don't learn. Yeah. So I was I was I was teaching in Arizona and I was teaching on a near a tribal land school. We had about 60% of our population came from the Navajo Hopi and a few Apache. And in my naivety, I would say to the students, you don't have your homework done. I'm going to call your home. And they just would give me this look like you don't know what you're talking about, right? So I remember the day a little grandmother walked in. It's a matriarchal society. 
uh, amongst the Navajo people. And I started with my speech. She just held up her hand. Just went like this, one minute. She said this, schoolwork is for school. When my grandson comes home, he's got sheep to take care of. He's got water to haul. He's got wood to chop to take care of our subsistence and ways of life. I changed in that moment. I never assigned homework again to any student. And I thought, oh, it took a grandmother to teach me a profound lesson. My goddaughter is Navajo. And I was working as an assistant principal when she came in and said, I am going through the rites of passage to womanhood. I said, yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to miss 14 days of school. I said, yep, that's awesome. When we understand what matters and why it's so important, we don't make silly rules for children and their learning. We honor and stand that that's an important part of their passage in life and their learning. And that's why we do this work. That's why we continue at this level to say, we need registered apprenticeships. We need teacher residencies. We need those in tribal lands. So they are there. They're learning from day one. They're in the culture. They love being where they're at and they wanna stay. We believe if we can do that and we can keep growing that piece, we'll start solving some of these challenges. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't say how important it is. For, I, I have uh, 15 grandkids and we're raising five grandkids. So um, the, the three that we, the three youngest ones we have, um, they came up from Standing Rock because um, their grandfather died of COVID and a lot of different complications and there was a lot of dysfunction in the home but um, they lived out in the country so they they know how to entertain themselves and things like that but um yeah i, I wish things were I, I wish they could come home and you know go feed the sheep or whatever but they, they, <laughs> they mostly come home and they, they get their devices so they're, they're on there doing roblox and you know of course we try to uh, make sure that they're not um communicating to people through social media that they shouldn't be and, and as much as possible with that but they you know when they're home they, they want to they want to relax and they have chores but usually we got to try to get them to do it but they're these my three youngest kids they're just they're, they're the best kids i've raised so far because they just they love school i mean they just for some reason they just they, they're just striving to have perfect attendance and they just they just love school being there but they're um the middle um girl kaimani she she has a kind of a conflict with with the uh, uh um, mr tumanong he's, he's a great teacher and he, he really for some reason he admires me and is following what i'm doing up here but um he, he's a, a, a filipino um gentleman and his his wife also works with the schools and then his brother works with the schools and i think they have um, relatives that work in the Fraser schools so like uh, as soon as we lost Roger White Jr., um, who's running his own construction company now, um, well, he was one of the the best uh, Assiniboine language instructors that we had because my uncle Bob taught him quite a bit. Um, but now the the only language that these kids in Fraser are learning is Filipino. Mm -hmm. So instead of <laughs> learning Assiniboine, they're learning Filipino. I mean, it's it's good for that type of thinking. Yeah to learn any any other second language but um there there's just so much of a need for 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 uh developing language instructors and then the appropriate language instructors like um representative smith had said you know we can't just take even if you take somebody from the other side of the reservation and, and put them in, into like fraser and have mm -hmm. them teach um a different dialect it's 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 really close but it's not the same thing it's not the same thing as having uh, um, an Assiniboine language instructor that is from the Fraser community or from the west end of the Fort Peck reservation and um, is involved with and knows the 
the protocol of of, um, of ceremonial life and the importance of you know why why it's important for for these things and it's it's really unfortunate that um, we do get people from from the community that um, have all the good intentions in the world to like start integrating sweats and then they're asking people that are involved in the culture with what the difference is between Dakota and Nakong, um, the, the the different ways of Assiniboine and, and Sioux, how the difference between that and and, and our, our ceremonies. And there, there's just so many differences. It's like, it's like France and Germany, you know, it's like two different nations, but we're on the same reservation. And people mm. don't know that. If you're not from the Fort Peck reservation, you don't know that there's two separate nations that are living within the Fort Peck reservation. A lot of times people think that Assiniboine Sioux is, is a tribe, and we are a tribe, but there, there's differences. And even in the Assiniboine tribe, there's we have two different clans, you know, the Opener and the Fox, and they're, they're, they're night and day too. There's, there's differences there. But um, yeah, I, I could really appreciate, you know, the, the, the need for teachers, and I've taken some uh, field practicum, you know, I've done some field practicum and taken educational psychology. So. Um, just the different um, courses that, that that you would take to get to to get a degree to become a teacher. Yeah, I know how complex it is. It is, and it's not easy raising a family. We've raised eight kids to adulthood, and we still have four kids now, four grandkids. And then it just it seems like raising kids never ends. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And even as they grow. <laughs> And they have with a 29 year old adopted daughter as they grow they still have they still have needs yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. which is which is what makes family so valuable well, we're gonna have instructors that know the family problems that we've got i know we had a superintendent our principal that told my daughter Oh, you're just going to graduate. You're going to come back here as a wino, just like everybody else. Or we had a student advisor that told my son, you're too stupid to go to school. Well, he's now got his own business. Both of them do. One of them's got a construction outfit in Billings. The other one has got a refrigeration business in Poplar. But I mean, we've we've had instructors like that, you know, that don't know and don't know what to say. We've had problems, quite a few problems like that, you know. And, but then, when you only got one application, what do you do? It's really a great question, isn't it? If you only have one, what do you do? <laughs> I had a boss one time who told me, I was a principal. He said, Cheryl, sometimes the best candidate is no candidate. Okay. And he said, if you have no candidate, he looked at me and he said, can't you teach? I said, oh, yes, I can teach. He said, so sometimes the best candidate is no candidate. And that's what I think is the answer. What do you do? You look at who you do have and how you can redeploy. And that's what I learned to do. So I'm with you. That's what do you do? Do you allow students to be given bad information or demeaning information because of lack of understanding of the adult? Or do you say, so... I'll leave you with this. So I told you I worked in a border town to the Navajo Nation. In our community, we had about 2,200 students that we served, but every teacher went through cultural awareness and understanding. Every teacher took Navajo language. Navajo at that time was not a written language. It was an oral language. So who were we learning the language from? wisdom elders that came and they taught and they taught we didn't teach each other we weren't learning it from people that didn't speak the language or thought they did we were learning it from the people because the genuineness 
of our district in wanting us to best serve all of our students demanded that we did things differently. So when we look at these elements and as we build in Indian Ed for All, and as we work with our school boards and our teachers and our leaders, it comes down to this core any more than if you went on tribal land or you were serving the students on a Hutterite colony or you had students that were refugees from Ukraine or other locations, you have to build an understanding because we all have one thing in common. We're all human beings. We may come in different packages, but we find what we can learn from each other and work from that. And if we can do this, we won't have a teacher shortage problem in Montana because people will come here because we build a community that says, I need to come sit with you, teach me what you know, share with me, guide me, give me insights that will allow me to serve better. And when we understand in education, our primary responsibility is the children. So let us put our minds together and see how our children can grow. Thank you, Cheryl, for coming today. I really appreciate it. And I think it uh, lends itself to also, you know, the work that we <laughs> do to talk about um, Donnie Wetzel and his group, right, and his unit and everything that's happening there. Really, all of this comes together. You know, and we talk about wanting to have more presence in the school, having tribal elders or even knowledge keepers coming into the school, speaking to not only the students, but also to the teachers. Exactly what you just said about in the Navajo um, to really um, beef that up a little bit. I know that we've had some elders come into some of our schools this year. Um, and then we talk about that a little bit in other schools. Oh, I never thought about coming and talking to the staff. It was more just talking to the students, but we, um, I think there's a huge recognition that we need to all be talking and we, um, and just more that knowledge keepers and the tribal elders understand that there's room in the education system, be it public education on tribal lands, we need them. So thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate it. But this isn't just tribal lands either. It's True. All lands. Correct. I think that just to just add one more thing, I think one of the, um, I think it was a great experience, but that was the, the chairman of the Wolf Point Indian Education Committee and they, the Wolf Point Schools had a strategic planning session and, and um, there were 22 instructors, I believe that relocated after that, but they, on their strategic planning session, they had like, what were the, the, the worst things about being an instructor at the Wolf Point Schools? And these, these, one of the topics was, you know, of course, you signed your name, um, and you know, you populated a certain area, and the the, the number one reason would have the, the most signatures or, or stamps or whatever. Um, and a majority of the teachers were were signing their name by the topic of these kids come from terrible homes, and then so it's like they got to that conclusion. Then I, I I stood up and I. You know, I said, I know you're not talking about your own kids, because if your kids are attending these schools, you're talking about how terrible their homes are. I said, you need to understand how we got to this place. It took us 200 years to get to this point. It's not going to take overnight to solve it. But the reason why there, there's so much of these, um, this, this dysfunction in our homes is, is these are all symptoms of, of what happened to us. This intergenerational trauma, all these different things. If, if you're an instructor that isn't here to help change that, then you need to figure out what your intentions are in teaching my kids. And if you're saying that my kids are come from a terrible home, then you're part of the problem instead of part of the solution. And then uh, there was a majority of them that left, you know, and we, we had ACLU that yeah, ACLU came in. There's a lot of different things that happen at this point. I, I know that there's a lot of room for improvement. I appreciate you guys. Um, every, everything that you're doing for our schools and with, like especially with this two plus two program and the wisdom keepers that's that's so important and I, I just as I get older I, I see um, how important your work is um, the other 
message I wanted to give from the caucus is that they would like to um, recommend that we move to Thursday at noon in this room if we're it's available um, because you'll you'll get uh, a majority of of the caucus members if you if you bring some lunch and if if you reschedule for Thursday because like right now Tyson Running Wolf um, Donovan Hawk um, Jonathan Windy Boy Sharon Paragoy Stuart Paragoy they're in committee. Marvin Weatherwax is already headed back home, I think. Um, and of, of course, uh, Senator Weber's in, in the, at home with COVID, um, but she 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 should be coming back. Um, and um, there's Senator Fox; he, he's in committee, I believe. So it's it's we're right in the middle of everything. But if we can reschedule um, this five o'clock or this four o'clock to noon on Thursdays, it would we probably get a better attendance. <laughs> So yeah, all right, thank you. That's all, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those that have joined us online today too. I see that there's four participants. Oh, Minneapolis, okay. St. Paul.